All right. So I'm going to get started here. I'm really thrilled that we've got everybody here joining us. In, in case you, you're not already, if you're in a loud environment, please mute yourselves, at least for the moment. I'm going to be sharing the slide deck that I'm going to have here. I'm going to be posting the recording after the fact as well. That's why it's recording right now. I'm going to post it in the workplace afterward. For those of you who don't know, I've done a couple of presentations here over the last several months. I did how I went from Fang to Fi. I did one on creative finance. Uh, I did one on hiring virtual assistants. Shout out to Margie here in the group with us here today. And just, you know, to give you guys a quick background on me, if you've missed all those previous ones, which, you know, I'm by no means a celebrity, so it's uh, totally fair if you don't know who I am. Uh, I'm a real estate investor who's bought and sold north of hundred properties, specifically here in Indianapolis. I'm married to my college sweetheart, way out kicked my coverage, as you guys can tell here in, in the photos. She's smarter, better looking, and works harder than I do. So really did well there. I'm 31 years old. I'm financially free. And as of about eight o'clock last night, I've actually turned in my notice at Meta. So I am now going to pursue real estate full-time after having done this for about five years. So today, we're going to talk about long-distance real estate investing. I'm going to talk for 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So please hold on to those until the end, put them in the, the chat if you guys have any questions throughout, and we'll make sure to, to tackle those, okay? If you guys have any technical issues, please let Margie and me know. So why would you consider investing out of state versus a, a California and New York? I know that's where a lot of meta employees are. First and foremost is price. California and New York are some of the most expensive markets out there. It's pretty cost prohibitive. I'll tell you, that was a large part of the reason why I ended up jumping into long distance real estate investing early in my career about five years ago. The next reason is cash flow. You're going to struggle to find cash flowing properties in, in New York, the Bay Area, Southern California, any of those, because the cost to or the, the rent to value ratio tends to be pretty skewed towards the, the value versus the rents. And we're going to go into some specific deals that, uh, that we'll review and, and I'll prove that. The next is diversification. Now, this is one that some people might not agree with, but I would much rather have many tenants on, you know, if, for instance, if I could have a million dollars of property, I would rather have 10 tenants paying me rent on that, that million dollars versus having one tenant paying me rent, because if that one tenant becomes a problem, then you're in a really bad spot. The other thing is, for a lot of us that, that live in the Bay Area, our W-2s are tied to the web. They're tied to tech stocks doing particularly well. I don't also want to tie my investments to them doing well as well. That's putting all of my eggs in, in one basket. The next, and again, I don't care what your politics are in particular, but it is a little prohibitive from a political perspective to own in many of the coastal states. Additionally, short-term rentals aren't necessarily terribly popular in those, in those markets when it comes to the political climate. You might, depending on your strategy, struggle with those in, in specific markets. And then finally, what's the difference? I'm going to assume that most of you guys are like me having no construction experience, very little real estate experience. Hell, you can look at the wall behind me. I don't even have anything on the wall because I don't trust myself to put something up on the wall straight. I've got literally got a piece of art right there. You can see that, uh, that I haven't trusted myself to, to hang up. So me walking a property doesn't add a lot of value. I need to hire qualified people. If the house was right next door to me, or if it was across the country, it really doesn't make a difference. I need a professional either way. I'm assuming most of you are the exact same. Yes, it's a little bit intimidating, but going out of state definitely has its advantages. And we'll talk a little bit about that here over the next uh, next couple minutes. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this house, 716 Kylie. It is one that is near and dear to my heart because it's the last house I lived in California. In June of 2020, we decided to play hardball with our landlord. And because I don't know if you guys all remember that, that rents were falling in the Bay Area at that time, and so we played hardball and we told them that they were going to lower our rent and get rid of the property manager. Otherwise we were going to move. He ended up selling the house and my wife and I were homeless there for a little bit. And we, we figured that piece out, but that house sold for $1.21 million. The rental rate on something like that is, was $4,000. That's how much we were paying on a monthly basis. So if you were to buy that investment today, your mortgage would be about $4,600 per month. That's just the principal and interest. That doesn't include uh, taxes and insurance. The taxes on that were about $1,200,000 a month. You have to account and you have to accrue for repairs and capital expenditures 
So you assume that's about $400 a month because eventually a roof's going to go out. Eventually a water heater is going to go out. You have to be prepared for that. Insurance. Yeah. Let's assume he was, he was paying about hundred dollars a month property management. Let's assume he's paying about 8%, which is fairly common with these kinds of high dollar amount investments. So for this house, his cash flow was essentially negative, almost $3,000 a month. Assuming 4% appreciation rate, which is uh, not as high as it, it potentially could be, the ROI on this property is actually only 9%. I'll tell you that I don't get out of bed for, for 9%. I'm not willing to risk this kind of money for 9%. Now, I'm going to compare that. Actually, pardon, but before I do that, even if rents were to increase 25% in this situation, even if it was $5,000 a month, that would have the ROI still at only 13%. So again, if you do this kind of deal, you're negative almost $3,000 a month. You are more tied to your job than the day before you bought this property. Sure, that would be great. All right. Well, would you like to- hey, if, you're not, uh, if you're not chatting, would you mind just uh, muting yourselves? Now, I'm gonna compare this to a property that I literally just finished up on and just got rented out, just refinanced as well. And it's 80 South history. It's a $200,000 property I purchased out here in Indianapolis. Now I did a bunch of rehab on it, but today it is worth $200,000. We just got the appraisal back. If you were to buy that house, you would put a $40,000 down payment. And it's currently renting out for $1.6,000 per month. My mortgage is about 800 bucks, taxes, insurance, all of that. And I'm making about $200 a month in total cash flow on this one. And with that cash flow, I am receiving an ROI of 25%, assuming that same 4% appreciation that we were assuming on the, the Bay Area as well. So I'll tell you, this is, in my opinion, a much better deal and something that can be done if you're willing to, to go out of state. And so I'm holding on to this one. This one is one I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on until the day. I... When you're thinking about any type of investment, you have to do a couple of things. And, and first is to pick your strategy. So I know all of you are Meta employees, so there are a couple of really key factors that you need to, to have. You guys are all busy. So you need to decide how active or how passive you want to be, whether ROI or ROTI is more important. And let me explain what I mean by that. ROI is essentially the internal rate of return. It's all of that, all of the, the benefits. It's the cash flow, it's the loan pay down, it's the appreciation, the tax benefits, all of those things that make real estate something that we're all so interested in, all divided by how much you have invested in that deal. In most cases, the down payment plus a little bit of closing costs. The ROTI is a slightly different calculation. It's that ROI, but then I divide it by the number of hours that you have to invest there. All of us are extremely busy. And so we all need to benefit whether ROI or ROTI is the more important metric for each of us. And then finally, whether you want streams or chunks of income. We're going to talk about different strategies that you can take with real estate investing at a distance. And I've done just about all of them at this point. And you need to decide, hey, do I want a little trickle of income on a monthly basis? Or am I more into getting a chunk at a time? So some of the strategies that you can do long, long distance are you can do the long-term buy and hold, similar to, to what we were just talking about, where you just buy it, put a loan on it, put a tenant in place and rent it out. You can flip, and this is much more, again, towards our previous conversations. It's one that you do chunks. You get chunks of income. Now, it's a pretty active in, in the grand scheme of things. Moving down, you can do the burst strategy. Again, very active. For those of you who aren't familiar with this term, it's the buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat strategy. So you're essentially flipping, but instead of selling it, you're refinancing that sucker instead. It's a, a really interesting strategy. It's a way to, to build wealth very quickly. But again, it's a very active, very active approach and has a high ROI, but a lower ROTI in most cases. You can do the short-term rental. I know a lot of people here in, in the Bay Area in particular tend to like that one. It's a really good strategy if you're looking to, if you're looking to benefit from it as well. Hey, let's go buy a vacation house and short-term rent it out. And we'll get to, to utilize that as well. Uh, it's not something I personally like to, to consider like the bread and butter of my, my portfolio, but it's something that I, I definitely do. I, I think it's, it's highly profitable, but it's much more variable. You can wholesale. Again, that's for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, you can buy the property or essentially get a property under contract and then sell it to somebody else for a slight markup. I'm sure all of you are pretty familiar with that. You can invest in apartments. Nothing really changes from a nuts and bolts perspective versus everything we talked about above. You can do a lot of those different strategies in apartments. The only difference is the financing. The financing tends to be based on the income instead of on you. And then finally, you can invest in funds, syndications. Again, you tend to get lower returns 
but it's a higher, higher ROTI because it's very easy for you guys. You just have to vet the, the operator and essentially invest in and be pretty passive. So we talked about the different, the different strategies you can take, the different considerations. The next thing you need to identify is your market. Uh, the things that I think each and every one of you, if you're thinking about going long distance, should think about are population and net migration. <laughs> These are super important metrics. You want to make sure that this is a growing area. You want to make sure that there are enough people to support whatever investment you're making and make sure that you are getting positive net migration. You don't want to invest in a, a city that's slowly dying. The next one is job diversification. I, I know the poster child here of this one is, is Detroit. Back in the day when everything fell apart in the auto industry, Detroit rental and just overall real estate went in the toilet because there's really one industry. You probably want to find a market that has a little bit more diversity, a bunch of different companies, a bunch of different types of jobs that, that are going to support the rental in any or, or in a variety of different, a variety of, of different economic environments. The next one, again, political alignment. I don't care what your politics are. It, it really doesn't matter, but you probably want to invest in a, a state that it has landlord friendly laws. Same with uh, making sure that it aligns with your strategy. If you want to go do the short-term rental route, I think it's a, a great potential approach, but you want to make sure that it's legal where you are. For instance, in the city I'm in right now, we are not le legally allowed to have a, uh, an Airbnb unless you happen to live in the property as well. So you want to make sure that, uh, that those laws are, are currently in your favor and project to be in your favor in the future. The next is affordability. We talked about it there in those two examples earlier. You can invest in the Bay Area. It's going to be $1.2 million for a purchase versus a house that in, in Indianapolis that would be in a similar asset class at closer to $200,000. Rent to value ratio, key metric. In that first example we had, it was a $4,000 per month rental for $1.2 million versus a $1,600 rental on $200,000. That rent to value is what essentially pays the bills and keeps your cash flow positive. And then there, there are a variety of other things you might want to consider. These are some of the ones that I really like to look at. So the next thing, a lot of you guys are engineers. I talked to a lot of engineers here at Meta about, about their investing. And gosh, you guys are, are ridiculously smart and incredible optimizers. But I see so many of you struggle with always trying to find that 1% better market. I think what's really important is time in the market, not timing the market, not finding the absolute perfect market to invest in. So my recommendation is define what good enough is for your market. Define what good enough is for your deal. Define what good enough is for your team member. There's always going to be a better one out there. So just make sure that you essentially define, hey, if I get 20% return on my money, I'm a happy camper. If I get, uh, if my market has a positive net migration of X and is, is X big, that's good enough. You're, you're always going to be able to optimize yourself to, to give yourself an excuse to put it off. So now it's time to really get into the nuts and bolts, in my opinion, building your team. The first member of your team that you're going to need is a lender. I know all of you guys think, hey, I've already got my house in, in the Bay Area. I'm just going to go back to my lender there. The person that did your $1.5 million loan in the Bay is not the same person. And they don't care about the $80,000 loan that you're going to do or your $150,000 loan you're going to do out of state. My biggest recommendation is go local, go to credit unions, go to, to local banks and build relationships with those local guys. Additionally, the type of lending you're doing on the, on the investment side is a little bit different. And a lot of the, the people that you work with for your own personal home don't have the expertise or the knowledge to get over that finish line. Figure out if they have experience working with investors versus home, homeowners. I would just call around to all the local banks and see, see, what, they, see what they recommend. Your objective here is to get a pre-approval before you move on to the next team member. You're going to need to come up with two months of bank statements, two months of pay stubs, two years of tax returns, the blood type of your firstborn child. Yeah, they're, they're going to want everything in order to, to get you a loan. But once you've got that in place, you're ready to, to take the next step, which is to hire an agent. This is a key person on your team. I highly recommend you, uh, especially on your first couple of deals, use an agent. I wouldn't recommend going through a wholesaler. And the reason for this is that the agent has to act as your fiduciary. That doesn't mean that they can't make mistakes, but they have to watch out for your best interests. So I highly recommend hiring one of these individuals to, to work with you. Now it's a delicate balance here. You want experience, but you want somebody who's also still hungry. So you don't want somebody who already does many tens of millions of dollars per year, but you also want somebody that has some experience. So you want to find that balance. I'd interview several of them if I were you. Out-of-state investors have different demands. 
than somebody who's looking to, to buy their primary home. You aren't gonna be sending them through the nicest houses always. And you wanna set that expectation. Early on, this person is gonna be your MVP. They should help connect you with the other team members that we're gonna talk about here. They could potentially also help you find an appropriate lender if, if they have some experience in this industry. But what's important is that you understand their incentives. They make less than 3% of the purchase price here. And you might send them out to, to 10 houses in order to, to get that less than 3% because they get their 3% commission. And then uh, they have to pay, pay their brokerage on top of that. Make sure that you're serious when you're sending them out to places. Make sure that you believe that this could potentially be a good deal. And I highly recommend each and every one of you actually learn to sell yourself and say, hey, this is, this is my first deal. I'm looking to do many more. If, if this is successful, essentially sell the long-term vision. Because when I started doing this five years ago, if you had two nickels to rub together, you were God's gift to investing. It's a little bit different today. Agents are a little bit busier than they were back then. So you want to really make sure that you find an agent and align with them. The next person that I recommend, and I would say that you should bring this person in once, once you have a property under contract, or at least once you're starting to, to make a bunch of offers. This is a very important person on your team. And while the agent early on is your MVP, Longer term, the property manager actually is the MVP of your team. It's the hardest person to keep long term. I've been through a lot of them, kissed a lot of frogs. It's a super hard, super low margin business. I compare it to being a police officer. When you're dealing with a property manager, it is the worst part of your day. Now, let me tell you why. Whenever my property manager calls me today, I know that it is going to be a four digit issue that he is needing me to, to approve. Whenever a tenant deals with a property manager. That's because they're behind on rent in the most cases and rent is due, or they're calling the property manager because there's something wrong with their home. The property manager always gets somebody's worst. So I highly recommend that you find somebody that's, that's ready to deal with that, that has great systems in place. And honestly, somebody you can get along with. On top of that, you need to understand their margin structure. A lot of these companies, all they're going to tell you is, hey, I'm only going to charge you 8% of rent. But what they don't tell you is that there are a variety of other fees that you need to, to understand. So you need to understand their, the way they make money on percentage of rent, leasing fees, markup on maintenance. Uh, a lot of times they'll do project management. They'll charge you hourly for different things. So you need to understand the total picture so that you're actually comparing apples to apples. Because where one of them might say, hey, I'll charge you 8%, another might say, I'll charge you 10%. That's not necessarily comparing the same thing. So understand, understand that. Also, cheaper isn't better. Like I said, this is a super low margin business. You want the service that, that all of you are going to expect. My best buddy owns several properties out here and he works with the, what I would call the discount property manager out here. And every time he has an issue, he knows it's going to suck. His experience is going to suck. And he looks at me with my experience with my property manager. And even though I pay probably 20% more in property management fees than he does, my life's a whole lot easier. So he's actually looking to make the, the jump. The last thing I'm going to say about property managers here is a lot of people think that these people are just bill collectors. And if that's how you're viewing your property manager, then, then I think you're sorely mistaken. They bring a lot of experience. They're your boots on the ground. And I recommend that you always hire a property manager, particularly when doing this from out of state. Your time is worth more, significantly more than what you're paying them to deal with this. And they're going to do it better than you. They're going to look more professional than you, and they're going to give your tenants a better experience. So I don't recommend skipping this individual on your team. Next member of the team is the contractor. I would lean heavily on your agent and your property manager to find these people. Most investors won't show their contacts. I don't share my contacts for contractors because unlike the other two, they tend to have an expiration date. I would do reference checks on all of these. I would ensure that they have insurance. I'd make sure that uh, you fill out all the appropriate uh, paperwork. W9, indemnification, lien release, in order to make sure that, that you're essentially covered off from a legal perspective. And the most important piece here is that I would only pay based on work completed. I hear tons of horror stories of people who wire tens and tens of thousands of dollars to contractors and have those contractors disappear. I'm okay giving a couple thousand dollars for materials to kick off a project. What I'm not okay with is paying after that point, paying for anything above and beyond the work completed. So make sure you only pay for work completed and I would have it validated either by a property manager, by an inspector, by you going out and seeing the work yourself before you, you are cutting checks until you've built one heck of a relationship with the contractor. 
I then have a variety of bench players that I recommend getting on your team eventually. I don't think you need it for your first property, but eventually you're going to need these people. You're going to need a CPA. You're going to need an insurance agent. Uh, the insurance agent you can probably get from your, your agent early on. You're going to need a great inspector. Again, you can probably get that from your, your agent early on. And you're going to need a lawyer eventually to help set up LLCs and all that stuff. But again, you don't need to worry about that on your first property and don't let that slow you down. So a couple of key pieces of advice for building the team. Be like Belichick. For those of you who, who don't understand this reference, Coach Belichick is pretty unemotional when, when it comes to hiring and firing players in the NFL. He goes out and finds incredible value and, and goes finds veterans to, to join his team. But then he's also very quick to fire if he sees a degradation in service. I highly recommend you do the same. Audit the books. Getting vulnerable here with you guys for a moment. I was swindled out of north of $100,000 out of a property manager because I didn't have his books audited. I recommend that either you are allowed to check the books or that there is a third-party auditor that checks your property manager's books, particularly as you, you begin to grow. It's a something that's an uncomfortable conversation to have, but it's super important because they're going to be holding large amounts of money. For instance, I have $50,000 in security deposits out there that is just supposed to be sitting in a bank. I want to make sure that's actually sitting in the bank because that is my money to make up if, if it goes missing. And then finally, compensate generously. Like I was saying, an agent only makes 3% on, on these deals, which I know sounds crazy, but in the grand scheme of things with how much I send my agent around, it's not all that much. My property manager makes 8% on me. It's not honestly that much. So I like to overcompensate these individuals and do different types of, of performance incentives in order to keep them in my corner and, and really taking good care of me. Hell, my contractor and I go out weekly for drinks. My agent gets a, a ton of business from me. He comes over with his family all the time, has dinner with us. My property manager, actually, I every time he raises rents, that uh, half of that first month's rent goes towards his, his daughter's college fund. So all of these things are, are things that I've done to go above and beyond and get me the incredible service that, that I need in order to, to be effective. And I, I recommend that you don't pinch pennies. You don't always look for the discount. Uh, if the deal still makes sense, compensate as generally, generously as you possibly can. So some things to ignore early on. I know there are a lot of roadblocks. It's a really scary thing to do. The first is legal uh, entity structure. Yeah, eventually you're going to have to figure that piece out if you're going to be purchasing a, a bunch of properties, but this is why you buy insurance. Eventually you're going to want to protect it, segment it off from you as that continues to grow, but it actually is going to make your financing harder early on to have that legal entity structure and trying to buy in there. So I wouldn't worry about that early on. The next piece is I wouldn't worry about building out the 10, 20 person team. Like I said, those are bench players. And some of these players can actually recommend other A players within their network. Eventually you're going to need that CPA. You're going to need that attorney, but you don't necessarily need them day one. A lot of people and a lot of engineers in particular, you guys are just freaking brilliant trying to plan everything out. They're always trying to figure out, all right, well, what do I do once I get my 10 loans, my 10 Fannie and Freddie loans? In most of these cases, you're buying your first, second or third house. When you get to number eight, come talk to me. I'll help you out. I'll, I'll make this a priority. But early on, take that cheap money as long as you can possibly get it. You also don't need to set up the perfect systems and tools. The systems and tools we used early on in our business aren't the same tools we're using today. The, the systems and tools you use to track one to two properties is very different than the one you do, use to track 50 plus properties. There are a bunch of free tools out there. Use them, utilize them. I'm a huge fan of Notion, but don't worry about building the perfect system before you can go purchase a property. Finding time. It doesn't matter if it takes six months. It doesn't matter if it takes a year. Find your why. And if it's meaningful enough, you'll find and you'll make the time. You don't have to read all the bigger pockets books. You don't have to read all of the information out there. As long as you can analyze a deal and you found a good market and a good team, that's enough. Uh, get enough information and then begin taking action. Timing the market. This is a conversation I have with a lot of people. I don't think anybody would have thought back two years ago. That, that real estate prices would have gone as crazy as they did. I certainly didn't. And I was in the thick of this real estate game and I lost out on over $200,000 of appreciation on a couple of houses I sold. Oh. Hey, if you're not, if you're not 
meaning to to chat. Would you mind just muting yourself? But yeah, I lost out on over two hundred thousand dollars of uh, appreciation because I sold a couple properties that, that I probably shouldn't have in the grand scheme of things. Cause I was trying to time the market appropriately. You're probably not smarter than the market as a whole. And in the grand scheme of things, time in the market is much more valuable than timing the market. If you own great long-term uh, buy and hold properties, you're going to win in the grand scheme of things. You just got to hold on long enough. So with that in mind, I've got a coaching program for anybody who's interested. You can check it out at giulianirealestate.com slash coaching, where we're going to go into how to actually do this really effectively. Nothing I, I sell or nothing I, I say is proprietary, but I, I hope to, to be that filter for people. So if you're interested, check that out. Uh, we're going to be starting up a cohort here in March. And then finally, going to open it up for questions, but you guys can always find me, reach me at nick at giulianirealestate.com or giulianirealestate.com. Um, really excited, but... Let's open it up for questions. I talked for about 30 minutes here. So I need you guys to help fill that gap time here. All right. I'm going to go to the chat then. If you guys are going to, I guess you guys can raise your hand. Thank you for the, the congratulations, guys. For anybody who missed the beginning, I actually turned in my, my notice here a couple of days ago, and I'm going to be pursuing this full time. Can you further explain financing based on income versus based on you? Yeah, a couple of ways that, that financing is done in real estate. Generally speaking, when most of us think about going and getting a loan, it is based on your income and your asset. And they have a very specific buy box that they're, they're going to get you in. So that's generally the loan, kind of loans that you're, you're going to go get those 10 Fannie Freddie loans. The next kinds of loans you can get are, are what are called DSCR loans. And some of them are done in an LLC. Some of them are done... In, a, um, in your personal name, you can still do them. And what it's based on is the debt service coverage ratio. So it's the net income, the net operating income, which is the rent minus all expenses, except for the rent, all divided by the rent. Generally speaking, they're going to be looking for a DSCR of 1.2 to 1.25 or higher. My, my bank that I currently work with requires a 1.2. It's based on the asset. It's not based on me, the individual. Any immediate questions? I'm going to just keep working down my list here. I have one question. When looking for a property, do you typically look for appreciation, cash flow? And with the fees that you mentioned of like 8% on property managers, like I've seen some properties that are good long-term, but immediate cash flow is like most likely on the negative. Is that something to just outright say, this is not something to consider given cash flow? Is there like a different uh, mindset that you should have when thinking through this? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't bet based on appreciation because right? that's fundamentally what you're doing. If you're, you're buying based on appreciation, that means you are taking a bet that there's a greater fool out there that is willing to pay more in the future. That's not how I, I like to, to do it. I'll, I'll build it into the numbers and I'll look at historicals. But if it doesn't make sense as a business today, I'm not willing to buy it. But you're right. Cash flow is super tight right now, even in, in out-of-state markets. It's super tough to, to find. In the grand scheme of things, even if you cash flow zero dollars, though, you put 20% down on a property, you cash flow zero dollars, you get no appreciation, you're going to immediately get a 6% return on your money, over 6% return on your money just in the loan pay down alone. So if you get those other things, then it, it begins to, to accelerate from there. So what I generally look for is one, can I add value? Because it, it Adding value, like going and fixing it up to make it appreciate, that's not as much of a bet. That is a, a business in and of itself. So I look number one for that. Does the cash flow at least a dollar so that I can I can go get that 6% return plus? And is there any way for me to, to essentially limit my how much I have as a down payment? That's generally what I'm going to look to do. And that's why I use the burst strategy quite a bit. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. All right, I got Aiden. Hi, um, thank you, Nick, for another very helpful session. Regarding property manager and also the legal part, what's mm -hmm. your experience and opinion comparing buying services from a company or building this one-on-one -on -one connection, for example, hiring a specific PM or lawyer helping your case? How do you compare those two options? Yeah, I've done both. I've worked with a large company on both sides, on the accounting side, on the legal side, on the property management, management side. I'm going to tell you it's an N equals one experience, okay? So I'm not going to, to say that this is right for everybody, but from an N equals one perspective, I like small. I, they need to be big enough to have systems, but I like small enough that I matter. Like it, when I started out, I had six or seven properties and I was with this large property management company and I would send an email and I wouldn't get a response for three days uh, because my business in the grand scheme of things, they had 700 plus doors. My business did to their business. Whereas today 
I work with a guy that has, you know, I don't know, about 200 doors, 150, 200 doors with him. And having six or seven properties on 200 doors, that's not half of his business. It's a sizable chunk of his total revenue. And he has the time to, to invest in me. So I'm a fan of going with somebody big enough to have systems or, and experience, but small enough to actually care about you as an individual. Thank you. Yeah. And same with my lawyer, actually. So what's funny is my lawyer, I used to be with a big firm. My lawyer and I are buddies now. He just invited me to a grand opening of this new, it's not a WeWork, but it's like a WeWork kind of thing that, uh, that he got invited to. He invited me over to his house to watch the beginning of March Madness. Like having those kinds of relationships, I, I love, but that's me. I'm, I'm very much a relationship, a, a sales guy. Got it. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that makes sense. I guess you have more control over this one-on-one type of relationship. But exactly. have you ever run into some like situation, for example, a key member left, uh, took another offer and how do you mm. handle these situations? Yeah. Yeah. I was Belichick in those moments and I fired that company. Uh, I had to go find somebody else. Um, yeah, that totally is an issue. And if you're thinking that this is a set and forget kind of business, Margie can tell you, we, we talk every single day about uh, about our, our business we literally th- this isn't something that you invest in and then forget it exists you need to continue to foster those relationship and and foster backups i'll tell you right now if my agent got hit by a bus god forbid i've got another agent i can go work with tomorrow if my property manager decided tomorrow to go out of business i've got a backup plan if my contractor decided that to, to, to go steal twenty thousand dollars from me We've got three or four more literally in the wings that we're continuing to build. Yeah. Continuing to, to build relationships and continuing to network is super key, specifically in a situation like you're talking about. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Troy, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you again. Thanks for yeah. the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Got a couple of questions. How do you feel about buying older homes, say in the early 1900s? And how do you feel about buying single families versus multifamilies? Great questions. I buy a lot of old homes. That's why I'm able to find the value add opportunities. Most of the houses we buy are early 1900s at this point, 1900 to 1920, because it's a huge value add opportunity. In a lot of cases, they've gone into disrepair and there's a price for anything. So I don't really have an issue with it. Now you're going to have to deal with more issues. You're going to have to deal with knob and tube wiring. You're going to have to deal with bad foundations. You're going to have to deal with a lot of those things. You have to make sure that you're prepared for that. I wouldn't recommend necessarily going on, taking on those challenges in your first property. Now, Early on, I would probably find something a little bit easier, maybe something lightly cosmetic at most for, for somebody to, to work with, simply because finding the right contractor and evaluating their work is quite difficult. Again, Margie can attest to this. We, despite years and years of experience, still can have our own struggles with contractors on a daily basis, depending on the day. So that's the first one. How do I feel about single families versus multifamilies? Now, I'm going to look like a total flip-flopper based on my previous answer. But generally speaking, I prefer single families for two reasons. Number one is appreciation tends to be stronger on single families. And again, I don't invest solely based on appreciation, but, but it's a nice little cherry on top. And so I, I prefer that. The second piece is when you buy a small multifamily, and again, I'm talking duplexes, triplexes, quads, you're going to get the worst tenant class for that particular area. And the reason I say that is when you live in a large apartment complex, you're going to get some level of amenity in exchange for your privacy. If you're buying a, if you're in a single family, you're not getting any amenities, but at least you're getting some privacy. When you're living in a duplex, you get no amenities and no privacy. So if you're buying a B class asset, you're going to get C plus class tenants would be my thought. I own a bunch of duplexes and the biggest headache I have is with these people living in duplex, just from a, a getting paid on a monthly basis, evictions uh, basis. It's almost always duplexes that we have the issue. Now, the cash flow looks better on paper, but your financial vacancy is going to be significantly higher than you think it is on those duplexes. Now, larger multifamilies, that's a different thing. I can't speak effectively to, to having done that. I've got friends that have done it and have been wildly successful, but I can't, I can't speak to the larger apartments. That makes a lot of sense. For the uh, 1900 houses, if you were not doing Burr and you were doing buy and hold, would you even consider those? If, if for instance, somebody like me had gone in and fixed them up, but decided to sell it instead, potentially with an inspection, because if it was built in 1900 and the foundation's in good shape, that house isn't going anywhere, man. They built them different back then. Those things were strong. Like you go into the, these walls here, they're nowhere near as, as robust as how they built them back, back early. Now, again, 
get an inspection on everything. Make sure that everything's been updated if you're going to buy them and you're just looking for a buy and hold. But yeah, if it's in good shape, absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm um, looking at Troy. You asked a question here. When you buy your first house, you get loans based on your numbers, credit score, income. As you scale, you buy as a business based on how good the deal is. Look up DS. Oh, Troy beat me to, to my earlier answer. Yes, Alex, you will be able to watch this recording later. Anybody else have any other questions they want to bring up? I'm just kind of working through the, the questions here down below. Yeah, I have a question here. Thank you, Nick, for the uh, for the great content. Yeah. My question is, if you're investing in remote like states, do you uh, do you build one team in that state and you do everything remotely while you're in your original state, or do you go back and forth a lot there in person? Yeah, early on, I didn't do as much traveling. I started doing more traveling because I thought I could do it all all like this, just via uh, Zoom wasn't even as popular back when I started doing this, but just on the phone. And while you can do that, I don't believe you can build the kind of relationships you need via Zoom. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, maybe this is so anti the metaverse or whatever, but I believe being eye to eye is a very different experience than, than being virtual. I recommend getting out there, but not to go see the properties. Like I said, we don't really add a lot of value in seeing the properties unless you have some background in construction I'm not aware of. What's valuable is getting close to your property manager and letting him see that you're a real person, getting close to your contractor, letting him see, oh, this is a real guy. This isn't just some money bag that's sitting in San Francisco. This is a person with a family and, and building that relationship, I'll tell you, has been absolutely key to a lot of the deals I've done. Uh, so I recommend getting over there maybe once a quarter and just taking people out to dinner as you're, you're building that team and, and showing them love, meeting their families. Do you um, do more than one remote state? I, so I, what's funny is I, I'm a fraud here. I was investing long distance for three to four years, uh, but then I ended up moving out here to Indianapolis and in, during COVID and fell in love with it. So we live in Carmel. So we're not investing remotely at the moment. That said, I will. That is eventually what I'm going to do. In the long term. I am, I'm, I'm leaving Meta here so that I'll have more time to go and, and build those networks in other markets as well. So I will diversify. My last question is regarding what tools do you use to find these properties from multifamily to single family homes? Do you use Zillow and, and yeah. Redfin or do you use something else? Yeah, I highly recommend using like Zillow, Redfin, all of those. I'd also get in contact with your agent. Your agent should be bringing you a bunch of deals as well. You should be talking to your agent and, and say, hey, this is generally what I'm looking for. Can you go find it for me? And they should put you on MLS portals and things like that to, to bring those to you. My biggest recommendation, and I know I said it before, but I, I want to reiterate it. Use an agent for your first couple of deals. Make sure you build that team around you. A lot of you guys are going to think, oh, I can go to wholesalers and get a, get a better deal. You're right. But wholesalers don't have to act as a fiduciary for you. And wholesalers are going to see you. And the analogy I like to make is that you're a dolphin out there. You're swimming. Wholesalers are sharks. If you're by yourself, that's a, that wholesaler will eat you alive. But if you've got that team, you're that pod. I don't know if you guys have ever seen like pods of dolphin, like beating up on, on sharks. You guys can win in that situation but you got to have a great team around you. So I recommend early on, take a slightly less profitable deal to use an agent and start to build that team in a, a safer environment where you've got somebody who has to watch your back. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Aaron. Hey, hey, Nick, first of all, thank you so much for the section. So I have a question on your suggestions on how much upgrade is needed for a rent, long-term rental property. So right now we have purchased a long-term property and it's not, it's in good shape. It's in good bone. It's just a little bit outdated. It only has one previous owner. So I wonder what kind of things I should be looking out for mm -hmm. so that I'm not spending too much on uh, the decorations and the uh, upgrades. Yeah. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. What I like to do, all of my units look exactly the same. It's, it's embarrassing, actually. From the inside, all of them look identical. It, it was funny. We were joking about this in the team earlier that my agent was looking for, for pictures of this one property. And we couldn't find them. I'm like, doesn't matter. Just go find a, a different one. They all look exactly the same because what we do is we tend to do a very simple paint job, make them very agreeable gray. Depending on the cabinets, I'm assuming, is this what, like 1990s build kind of thing? I think so. Yeah, yeah. It has like oh, old, okay. so it's, and old cabinets. Yeah, like pine cabinets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I can totally picture that. I grew up in that. So uh, yeah, what I like to do, and it sounds, 
uh, I personally like the pine, but uh, a more modern look is to have painted, painted cabinets, to put nice poles on there. Just to paint a house should be about $2 a square foot, two fifty dollars a square foot. To put new, uh, to, to paint the new cabinets or the, the existing cabinets is a couple hundred bucks. You might want to put, I don't know what the countertop is, if it's like that crappy Formica type stuff, what you can do is you can rip that up. And I like butcher block. Butcher block looks really modern, super easy. And then depending on the carpet, I'm assuming it's carpeted. I like to put down vinyl plank everywhere. It tends to be more bulletproof. You rip up that old stuff and that stuff lasts for 10, 15, 20 years through several tenants. But like on something simple, something cosmetic like that, we probably spend about six to $7 a square foot in order to, to really upgrade it and, and get that 75th percentile. That's generally what we're targeting on our rents. 75th percentile, if, if you look at a tool like Rentometer, we're higher. And it, we tend to get it. Awesome. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you want more help on that, shoot me a note and we can talk about that one in particular. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I see Oscar just can't turn his video on. Do you have a question? I do have a question. Thanks, Nick. I'm looking to get started and I actually do have an agent in front of mine who is interested in partnering with me on going in on business together. I'm struggling with the first property, he has access to properties that, you know, are a little bit more affordable, but they're located in areas that are not exactly the most desirable. So I'm worried about the tenant class basically, but they're more affordable. So I'm trying to weigh, like, should I dive into, but also like the properties that he's showing me, they are, they're trying to, they're trying to gentrify the area. So the quality of the actual renovations is pretty good. I'm just concerned yeah. about it being in an area that may not be as desirable just because I'm concerned about whether or not people are able to pay rent and whatnot versus looking in more established location, in more established areas where property values may be more expensive for me to go into. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the houses I invest in aren't houses I would generally choose to, they're not neighborhoods I would personally want to live in, but that, that doesn't mean that they're not good homes, they're not safe homes. So I think that needs to be your thought process is think about who you want your tenant to be. That's something that's, I'm very clear. I want a family of three to four with a dog because I want them to move in, put all their stuff there and stay there for five to 15 years because I'd consider that a one because they're going to go to the schools there. So figure out who exactly you want and would they live in that particular market? You don't have to want to live in every house you buy. 90% of the houses we buy, I wouldn't want to live in, but that doesn't mean that you're not providing a good affordable home for somebody. Yeah. And it's a tough one. It, it like homes for, for so many people are an emotional decision. Eventually they're going to have to become just a commodity for you. It's just another trading piece that, that you've got there to, to hopefully provide incredible homes for people, create opportunity for people. Yeah. All right. I see Srin. Yeah. Did I say I that right? Yeah, that's right. Train. Congratulations. Anyway, I had a question. So when you consider these deals, how much of it is, do you also consider living space versus lot size? Living space versus lot size. Very little. That's because I'm generally investing in the kind of inner city of Indianapolis. So the lot sizes can be postage stamps as compared to the houses. It's generally not much of a consideration for me. Right. Thanks. But maybe it should be. Maybe it should be a bigger consideration. What's making you think about it? I have a couple of properties in California itself, which I'm using as rentals. In long run, it, I sometimes debate between future appreciation and as well as ongoing income as well. What's the value that I should be looking at? But as I look at outside of uh, California, then I want to consider what is the, if lot size is of important or not. So I'll tell you the only reason why I would consider lot size as something that's interesting is, hey, could I toss another dwelling on there. Mm. So like I've just picked up a spot in Noblesville, which is a, an A-class area here in Indianapolis or Indiana. It's just North of Indianapolis. And like, it's on an acre. I think I could toss a couple little tiny houses on there and then turn it into almost like a little apartment with, with individualized space. So that would be the only reason I would consider it, but maybe there's more to that that I'm just not digging into. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Aiden, I see you're back. Yeah. Hi, Nick. It's me again. Uh, actually, yeah. another question. So you mentioned, I remember you mentioned like in the previous session, like you don't look yourself as expert in, for example, property management or laws or, or doing the construction stuff. What is your interviewing process with this expert? And uh, what are the tips for someone who don't know much knowledge, for example, how to do pro uh, pro property management to find a good PM partner? 
Yeah, are there a variety of questions that you can ask? I've got a, a whole list of questions. If you guys are interested, feel free to, to reach out. But I recommend you interview. You need to ask the questions. Hey, how many do you currently uh, manage? What are your fee structure? Like actually understanding if they don't break down their entire fee structure, that's not somebody I, I want to deal with. But what, what times do you, you guys pay out? Do you have on staff maintenance or do you farm it all out? What technology stack do you guys use? It's really important that they have answers to all of these kinds of, of questions. Otherwise, they're just some back, backwoods uh, property manager that's managing four or five properties and probably isn't doing it very well. The reason you're paying somebody is for their scale. And you want to make sure that they actually have that scale uh, appropriately. Yeah. How do you check their, for example, in-domain knowledge? For example, the tools they use or their cost structure is better than... Mm -hmm. The other one, or well, you call, you call three or four, you talk to a bunch of them and you say, Hey, can you explain your cost structure? Like explain it to me. Like I'm five. Okay. Is it, is, that's the, the meme. And so that, that would be a piece of it. And then also I would actually go in and check those, those softwares. I would literally go on YouTube before I moved over to a property manager and I would look up like, Oh, buildium. I've never heard of this one. Is it any good? And I would watch YouTube videos of people like doing walkthroughs of Buildium just to make sure that the software is actually good. And then finally, referrals. I will not give my contractors contact information to anybody. I will give my property manager because that's the kind of thing that him growing just means, it doesn't mean less service for me. It actually improves my service in a lot of ways. So yeah, I would get referrals from people for sure. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you, Nick. Absolutely. I'm going to totally butcher this. Supriya, I, know, I see your videos on. Do you have a criteria for when you want to sell? You're done with the property again. I buy every property with the intention of holding it until the day I die. That is ne probably never going to happen on any of these properties. So generally speaking, what I do is I evaluate when, whenever it vacates, I look and I see, all right, what is the highest and best use today? Is it, has this area appreciated so much? that it makes sense to, to sell it off because I've got so much equity or refinance or like in this current scenario, given the current value, does the rental that I can get for it make sense? So that, that's essentially the math I do. It's, there's no formula for it. It's just, oh, this place is appreciated by 20% in the last year and now, but the rents haven't gone up at all. Maybe I'll just go capitalize and take that capital off the table and go invest it in some other properties. Okay. But so there's, no, there's no formula. You're not continuously analyzing that, okay, you've built enough equity that you can probably sell this and like buy two more out of the equity that you get. You can, but transaction costs for selling are pretty high. You have to keep that in mind. It's six to 7% of the value right. of the home in transaction costs. So yes, you totally can do that. But I like to actually equity strip a lot too. I like to refinance it when, okay. whenever it makes sense and go and just pull that equity out, keep the property and go use that equity elsewhere. Okay. Yeah, but no, it's, it's totally agonizing. And Margie can attest to this. Like a lot of times in our morning meetings, I'll be like, I haven't made up my mind yet. Just give me some time. Give me a couple minutes. Because yeah, I, I do the exact same thing. I second guess myself constantly. Yeah, cool. All right, Annie. Thanks so much for this. I have two questions. One is if you were inheriting a tenant with one of our properties and the rent is definitely below market value. So I'm curious to your thoughts on just leaving the rent it as is to like keep the tenant happy and, and in there and then potentially like after a year of managing it, then increase it or come in like on the onset with a rent increase with, with the chance of potentially losing them. Are they on the lease right now? Uh, they're on month to month. So we were, we're going to put them on a proper lease. Yeah. So what I, I tend to do, I, I'm generally buying with the intention of doing value add in some way. So is this a value add situation or is it like good to go? Like it, it doesn't need it's, to be. Improved. Yeah. The, the unit that they're in is good to go. So we don't really need to do much to it. So this might make me a jerk, but why are you subsidizing their rent? What's that? Why are you subsidizing their rent? Yeah. So it's literally just a wealth transfer. Yeah. Because if you if they weren't in that house, you would rent it out for X amount more. So you're essentially subsidizing their rent by X amount on a monthly basis. That's true. Okay. Like That's just helpful. because somebody else mismanaged it in the past doesn't mean right. that you have to continue to mismanage it. Mismanage it. That's not your responsibility. Which I feel like a total jerk saying that. 
but no, but it's a numbers it's game. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And then my second question is, I know you mentioned like under 10 units to not worry about any like systems and tools, but I was just curious for, do you, are there any like online software, or like management systems? Like if we're just managing the properties ourselves, and it's just a few of them, like that you would recommend that are helpful just to stay organized or for rent payments or anything like that. Yeah. I, I don't, since I've never self-managed, I can't speak to that side as much. That said, I can speak from an owner's perspective. Propertyware is a really good one. And Lazil, my one of my other assistants here, she is a huge fan of that one. So that might be something to, to take a look at. I really like Buildium, but it sounds like the accounting on that one might be a little more difficult. So I'd probably go with Propertyware if, if you're managing a couple units yourself. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And just for everybody, I personally use Notion to manage our entire business. It's an awesome tool, but it's not, you don't take payments through Notion or anything like that. It's more of a, an information database. Uh, all right. Samer, uh, I'm totally, I apologize. You got it right. I go, this is a Matsy help for a lot. Yeah. And yeah, uh, my question is similar to the property manager question earlier, but for agents, what kind of questions uh, do you ask them? How do you evaluate like uh, what kind of agents you want to uh, hire? And uh, where do you find Yeah, them? I highly recommend finding local groups. So for instance, if you were looking to invest in Indianapolis, one of the best groups you could possibly join is the Indianapolis Out-of-State Investors Group on Facebook. Absolutely fantastic. So I highly recommend finding whatever that local group is. I'm sure that there are a bunch of uh, investors out there. Bigger Pockets is another one because if they're on Bigger Pockets, they're not necessarily uh, going to be somebody who's looking for for a an end home type of, of buyer. They're going to be understanding of the fact that this is an investor and a little bit different. So those are two factors. I would look for referrals within that market, and then I would ask questions about, hey, have you worked with investors before? Can you show me some wins that you've had? And I want to be talked through those experiences. I'd actually ask the question, hey, do you invest yourself? It's not a prerequisite, but I do think it helps if this person's an investor themselves. And then I would ask, what kind of support systems do they have? So if, if they don't have some type of assistance back at the, the brokerage, you might have a little bit rockier of a rockier of a, a, an experience. And finally, I would ask questions about, hey, do you have an inspector you like? Do you mind if I talk to them? And then I would actually call their recommendations and ask the opinion of that particular individual. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Jason, sorry, my voice cracked there. I'm going through puberty. Yeah, my question is, you said you're looking for a family of three with a dog to live there for 10 to 15 years. Do you look at schools? Do you evaluate the schools around the properties you're buying or, or not? Or is just a, basically you evaluate the property based on the cash flows? Both. The schools are not uh, a prerequisite by any means, but if I have two, two identical properties and I'm looking to, to figure out where I'm going to put my money, I would bet on the one with, with better schools in the long term. That said, I'm buying mostly in Indianapolis. The schools aren't great in Indianapolis. None of them are. It's kind of comparing multiple bad options. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I've got Oscar. Are you still, do you mean to have your hand up? I did not. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, all right. Suita? Suita? Hi, Nick. Thank you for the presentation. My question is around the growing concerns around climate change and uh, natural disasters everywhere. So do you have any contingent plans in place for those, like having additional insurance for the particular uh, area that you have properties in? Yeah, we've got insurance in, in those. I am very cognizant of a lot of these issues and I choose where I invest with that in mind. Indianapolis is pretty central in the country, not a whole lot of, of things to be concerned about. And that's a huge factor for me. I wouldn't go invest in New Orleans. I wouldn't go invest in a lot of parts of Houston, for a lot of parts of Florida for those reasons. Yeah, insurance and then market selection. Maybe that should have been on my presentation earlier. I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, but that's a, a really interesting one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Because the whole country is getting beat up pretty much. What was that? The whole country is getting beat up pretty much. No kidding, man. The whole world. The whole, it's pretty crazy. I'm going to move here through a couple more of these questions here in the chat, and then I'll let everybody go unless there's anything more. Yeah, I've got confirmation that property managers can 
very greatly. Their percentages don't necessarily uh, align with what they're actually charged. Compensate generously. Does it mean not asking for a rebate from your buyer's agent? Generally speaking, yes. I like to, to pay my buyer's agent when, when they do a good work for me. I learned that a legal entity can help with delayed financing, refinance within seasoning period. When you were in California, how did you approach the legal entity problems real in California, guys? California really gets you. I think it's an $800 franchise tax for each individual one you own. So I like to have individual LLCs in that market that are owned by one, one California LLC when I was there. It's not necessarily the, the easiest or most efficient. I can't speak to the delayed financing. I do know that exists and I've got a great lender for you who you can talk to about that if you have any questions. Regarding the property management, what's your experience and opinions comparing sourcing a PM on your own versus buying services from a property management company? I'm unwilling to do property management myself. That is a hard job. It's a super low margin job. And it, like I said, it's the worst part of somebody's day. I want to hire that out as much as humanly possible. I got the question about a climate change. Do you stick to one market? Yes, at the moment. But as I have more time, I'm hoping to expand beyond it. I just haven't had the time or energy to do that. We still join us to give these talks after you depart meta. You guys are going to have to invite me back. So somebody will have to, to host it for me and, and let me come on back and, and give chats. How much is the coaching program? Check it out on the site. There are a couple of different programs. I would love to, to have you involved. It's a six month program that we help get people from just starting out to, to buying their first properties. When would be a good time to set up your LLC? The minute that it doesn't actually slow you down from buying properties. So I'd recommend once you've bought a couple, uh, that would be the direction I would go. How do you incentivize contractors to better serve you? I hold money back. I don't pay them until the work is done. I also take them out to drinks on the regular and I give them the promise of, of future deals. Additionally, I will, if I do particularly well on a deal, I'll go take them out for a really nice dinner. But I don't like to give them extra money because extra money just goes into your bank account and you forget about it. I like to give them experiences or, or something that's a little bit special. How do you feel about midterm rental markets, 30 day plus? I do that a decent amount. We've got a couple of, of furnished ones that we do furnished finders on. They tend to do pretty well. Yield is higher. It takes much more management though. It's something just to, to be cognizant of. Also, you have to pay for utilities, which can influence your cash flow. So you just always have to do that highest and best use and, and that ROT calculation that we talked about earlier. When you mentioned uh, check the books for PMs, what are you thinking specifically looking for? Are there any patterns? Yeah. So you just want to make sure that all the security deposits are in a separate account that they are not accessing and it isn't part of their, their accounting. You want to make sure that, that their books essentially match what their property management software says. That wasn't the case in this situation that I, I got screwed up there. Is it recommended to use a HELOC on primary home to fund purchase on rental properties? Yes, I love that. Take a look at my creative finance conversation I did a little while ago. Until Meta takes it down, it's a, a really good resource. Definitely recommend you check it out. Do you do everything remote or uh, do you go and see each property in person? Margie can attest to this. I have seen almost none of my properties, despite the fact that I live less than 20 miles away from most of them. And again, I had no value by being there. So I choose not to do that. When you look for property managers, any tips to ensure that you're acting on your interest and not trying to make extra money for getting kickbacks on maintenance? If it doesn't match your pro forma, if they're charging you more than 15% over a long period of time, they're screwing you. That would be my recommendation. I would also talk to other clients and make sure that they're not having a similar bad experience. Did you recoup any of the money that was stolen from you? Can you provide any legal issues you've encountered and how you dealt with them? That's the only real big legal issue I've personally dealt with. I'm currently suing Keller Williams to get my money back. So keep your fingers crossed. We're supposed to hear something back by March 9th. That would be a nice little kickback. I'd take that. How do you gauge the rental value of a property? Look on Zillow. Go look for, for similar listings on Zillow. I also use a tool called Rentometer. Really highly recommended. Do you believe you need a property manager for short-term rental? Yes. Absolutely. You need a property manager for short-term rental more than on long-term rental. And the reason I say that is your time is extremely valuable. And that is a super high touch industry. Highly recommend it. If you want, want validation on that, reach out to me. I'll connect you with a buddy of mine who's a short-term, actually two buddies of mine who are short-term rental property managers, really good guys. that will just give you an honest opinion, even though they're not in your market, they'll just tell you how it is and what their experience is like. I joined late and maybe I missed it. Do you offer these property purchase and management services for passive buyers? If so, what's your minimum net worth potential loan to take on? All right, I will talk to you later. I'll also post this video. We do have uh, services that we offer people, but I don't wanna, don't wanna use this necessarily as a sales platform. Can you share uh, your contact information so we can arrange these talks with you in the future? Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm gonna post it here in the chat, but it's nick at giulioni.com. I'm also gonna post this up here on the... Um, on the real estate group so that you guys will have all my contact information and website. 
Uh, and last one here of the day, actually, hold on, we got one hand up. So I'll do that one last. What's your advice for locating a good property manager in a different country where you do not have connections and you are forbidden to enter due to COVID? Oh boy, uh, that's a tough one. Again, referrals, go to your market. And if you need help, reach out to me. I'm more than willing to, to help you think through the, the best strategy, but uh, I would find referrals. I would talk to other investors in that market. We're willing to share those kinds of contacts. Again, contractor, no, generally speaking, but property manager, absolutely yes. Any red flags on properties you look at for like a high HOA? Yeah, I don't like to buy anywhere where there's an HOA because I lack control in those situations. I can fix anything in a house for the right price. I can't fix not actually having control of my property. And HOAs, you don't actually have control of your property. All right, I'm looking at... Um, Monel shot. I'm uh, so sorry. No, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. One last question. I think, uh, thank you first, like for this, just like last question. I know we spoke about a lot of things on here, like for a investor, like what is, how did, should they get started? Like I have a property here, uh, two properties in the Bay area, but now I'm looking to go into a long distance. Like what is the first step? Because we can look into the markets. You can talk to agents. You can talk to property managers and there's just overwhelming list of things to do. Yeah. Um, what's your recommendation there? Yeah, take, uh, you, you need to build a foundation. And that's really what it comes down to. And the foundation is, hey, this is my investing criteria. This is like how much time I want to invest. This is what my return needs to be. That is the, the baseline. So you need to have that solid and know exactly what you want to do. Then you move up and you set what your market is. Once you have your market, like you find your good enough market that you want to invest in, then you move up and you find that agent and lender. Those can happen concurrently. So I highly recommend that you, you build those prior to before you ever get there. And once you have that lender and agent, then things start to roll. But you need to really set that foundation of what a good investment looks like for you. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. And if you have any more questions, feel free to, uh, to reach out. We'd love to help out any way I can. Any advice on dealing with difficult sellers who can be overly and unnecessarily hard nosed? even for basic items like providing keys and fixing things pre-closed. Yeah, right now it's a, a seller's market for sure. They get to, to be jerks, unfortunately, and you don't have a whole lot of recourse. Yeah, I recommend if it depends if they agree to, to fix the items, then you don't close until they fix them and lean the heck on your agent. If the, your agent can't get the keys, they're not doing their job properly. So this is, that, this is fundamentally why you have an agent is to deal with these issues, to make sure that the contract is... Uh, observed. And so you should at closing be getting those keys, no problem. So MT, if I didn't answer that question effectively, please reach out. I'm more than willing to, to help out however I can. Okay. Guys, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, please reach out to me if there's anything I can do to help. I've got a free Calendly, more than willing to, to toss 20 minutes on the calendar for me to talk about your specific situation. It's giulionirealestate.com. Uh, it's got a lot of vowels, so be careful. And nick at giulioni.com. I'll post this here after the, after the course. And uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys all joining. I hope you have a good one, okay? Talk to you soon.